website. So it's not going to be used for any nefarious purposes, um, <laughs> unless you want it to Unless be. we can think of something that would be really fun, but I, I yeah. don't have any in mind. I mean, um, I could show it to the manatees. Maybe they'd like it. I don't know. <laughs> you could be responsible for the next generation of manatees. That you really be, could. Like, you could imagine inspire. how good you would feel about yourself. <laughs> The manatees of Valencia Cove are ready to be inspired by you and you alone. <laughs> um, so just send us a little message if, uh, if you don't want to be on camera, if you are one of the storytellers. Speaking of, any storytellers here, give us a wave. Yeah. All of our storytellers are here. Beautiful. Mama, Cheryl, Jimmy. <laughs> And so let's let's give a round of like excellent Zoom clapping to our storytellers. Like, yes! Yeah! Yeah! This is I find they work very well also. All good. I love it. So welcome. So, I'm glad you guys are all here. The other like tech thing that I will say when, when people are telling stories, um I am going to put them on spotlight view so that you can see a nice big picture of them. But you as the storyteller maybe are not so interested in just seeing your own face the whole time that you're telling a story. So you don't have to. I'm going to put you on spotlight view, but you can go up to the upper right corner of your screen and click back on gallery view so that you can see everybody that you're telling the story to. Uh, oh, got one more person to bring in the room. Same, same goes for everybody. If you'd rather look at the whole gallery, that's totally fine. You can definitely, just as Stacy said, top right corner, hit gallery view. Yes. Awesome. So, okay. shall, we, shall we full steam ahead? Hi, Danny. Yes. Welcome. So, oh, our theme, we should maybe tell you about that. Our theme for this month is alignment. I'm just going to read you the description of the theme. Still on lockdown, watching the numbers across the US climb and all the categories we need and want to see them decrease. Black folks suddenly turning up hanging in trees and law enforcement insisting their suicides, not lynchings. The presidential election is getting closer and Caligula, which is the only thing I will call the president. Caligula and his masters and minions are working overtime to disenfranchise as many of us as they can. Nothing about any of this feels like alignment, except this time has brought so many of us closer to our loved ones, has pushed us to focus on getting our houses in order, has shown us new ways to make time for our passions and our work, has distilled our day-to-day -day into a clear focus. Isn't this a kind of alignment? And isn't there alignment in our fight for safety during the pandemic in the face of a federal government that seems entirely uninterested in our lives? Haven't the Black Lives Matter protests turned us into a new alignment? How have the last several months strengthened or created alignment for you? In what ways are you aligned today that you weren't at the start of the year? Who or what are you aligning with? What differences are those alignments making for you? Season six of How to Build a Fire is drawing to a close and we are reflecting on alignment. And we are thrilled that you are here to reflect with us. Okay, so it's time to start. A volume great last. Let's get some storytellers. All right. Now I would love to introduce first and foremost an excellent, beautiful friend of mine um, who I met on his birthday. Uh, he was drunk and at the beach and I kidnapped him from a terrible party and made him tell me stories the very first time we met. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I'm excited that he's here tonight. Um, James Lang is a shape. Am I, am I saying your last name right? Yes, it is in fact Lang. It's not Land or anything like that. Okay. James Lang is a shape shifting artist and educator who uses new experiences to continuously reconfigure perception and perspective. He sifts through critical theory and cultural studies, sprinkling in his own unique witticism and bizarre but relatable humor <laughs> in order to offer bemusement a chair while teaching others sociocultural philosophies. 
Lang sees himself as both, both a teacher and student and feeds himself endless possibilities in between offering bite-sized reflections on humanity's different soulful debates. Lang draws his energies from human connection, caffeine, friendly philosophical debate, and the company he keeps while awaiting his next transfiguration. James Lang, everybody. Welcome. Oh, uh, I think you read that beautifully. That was, that was awesome. <laughs> You're awesome. It's hard not to be like excellent when I'm talking about you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you want me to just jump right into it? Go for it. Do what you gotta do, my friend. But okay. hold your camera so, still because you're like all over the place. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Yeah, hold on. Uh, is that better? Perfect. Yes. That's perfect. Now okay. it's like all of yeah. your excellent. Yeah. Hair. Yeah, so I'm I'm doing this all by hand, so if it's shaky, that's that's why. So um, when I was told about this, uh, I was only told about a single word, alignment. So you know, I didn't really know exactly what to tie it to, but then I thought of my own alignment um, in terms of society, culture, um, and like body image. Uh, so at birth, I fell out of alignment with um, able-bodied society. So I, uh, I had a stroke at birth, which caused me to have cerebral palsy. Um, and and having cerebral palsy, I was immediately labeled disabled. Um, and in being disabled, you find out very quickly that you aren't really welcome in able-bodied society. You, you don't align with able-bodied values. Um, able-bodied people tend to see you as either misshapen or broken. A lot of times they see your life as tragic, even when you don't. And it's very difficult because able-bodied people control the majority of cultural narratives. Um, and in that happening, you find yourself constantly questioning how you can try to be a part of a world that doesn't actually want you or value you. But what is very interesting about alignment is also in being someone who was rejected by able-bodied culture, I was then able to find a home in disabled culture and disabled society and got to find out how even though a lot of the culture you know that is just known by people who are disabled um, is completely unknown by able-bodied people because they don't have any interest in it. Um, oftentimes when I was younger, uh, it was interesting because um, able-bodied people thought they knew what cerebral palsy was, but then when they gave their answers, they were completely wrong. And a lot of the times I was there to try to teach them, but they wouldn't listen. So I, again, was trying to realign able-bodied people to see a world that they weren't able to see themselves because of their disinterest but also they were unwilling to be corrected by a disabled person, which I think is very, very fascinating because it's able-bodied culture wanting to control a narrative that is strictly a story where my life and the lives of other disabled people are unfortunate, are pitiful, are unwanted, 
And if you, you dig very, very deep into the narratives of able body culture, you find out how dark the story actually goes. And it's unfortunate that at one point, America was keeping disabled people from being seen with the ugly laws. And they were also erasing disabled identities by practicing eugenics, which is very, very unfortunate. But one of the saving graces of disability and alignment is academia and intelligence. Um, because whereas there were many, many people stepping forward saying that, you know, disabled people don't belong and disabled people are unwanted, there were also academics stepping forward and being like, you're blowing this out of proportion and you're creating a socio-cultural narrative for a group of people who belong just as much as anyone else does. And with all of this happening, you get to see all of these different narratives coming together. And you get to see the ways in which culture both progresses, but also stays the same. Um, and it's very, very amazing to know that just like every other human being, you get to uncover who are your allies and who are your enemies and who are the people that will always be stuck in a traditional form of thought that has been long outdated. So after spending my childhood in special education programs, because there was no other place to put me, I got to take the opportunity to meet other people who are disabled. And in doing that, I also got to learn what the differences were between the thought processes between able-bodied people and disabled people. Able-bodied people tend to be competitive with one another. They tend to try to find ways that they can prove themselves better than the people around them, partly because capitalism teaches us all that we need to be better and that in order to be better, someone has to be below us. Um, but what was fascinating was that when I was working alongside other people my age who were disabled, we just figured out who could do what and we just offered assistance and we offered help. We didn't try to prove who was gonna come out on top and who would be left at the bottom unable to really do anything for themselves. We found very quickly what it meant to have a sense of community. Um, and from there, a broader narrative took shape as to how we would find out through our lives the ways in which we would and wouldn't belong. I can come across someone in the street and they will look at me and assume that I'm either drunk or that I have an intellectual disability because of the way that I walk or that I might also be on drugs. And they base all of this on physical appearance, which mine aligns with assumptions that people hold very near and dear to, but which aren't true at all. And from there, I get to learn who sees me 
and how they see me. Um, you know, earlier, even someone, um, you know, pointed out that, like, you know, my camera was shaking, but they didn't realize that it's tied to cerebral palsy because you know so little about me. And I think what's really interesting about alignment is that you never get to know someone until you ask a question. But most people don't ask questions. Most people are driven by what they think they already know. And if you go down a road where all you do is assume that you know things rather than taking the same amount of time to just pose a question to find out what's actually there, it's, it's a reflection of where your morals and values are. And, you know, as a disabled person speaking on the last day of Disability Awareness Month, what's very interesting is even though I can spout all these things, I'm also no different because what I do is I look and I draw as many conclusions as I can from what I see. I gauge a person by how thoughtful they look. I gauge a person by how their hair looks, how tall they stand. I gauge a person by whether or not, you know, they're well kept, whether or not they look like someone I could start a conversation with. Because I have been taught to always go through life knowing that a person will either be thrown into a category of friends or enemies. And that there very rarely is a middle ground but there's not a middle ground because I'm not creating one. I'm staying as silent as the other person is. I'm standing there saying, I already know, but in truth, I don't. There are so many reasons, so many justifications to keep myself out of alignment with what another person is and with what I am. I, at the end of the day, am just a mortal and just a person who takes the 24 hours I'm given each day and uses it in the ways that I think are the most productive. And the vast majority of the time I don't use my time to get to know people because there's, it's too much effort. And as I say that, unexpectedly even, I, I see the truth of why it is difficult to have a community, even to have a meeting like this one where there's not enough time to know every person on this call and even if i got to know every person on this call would i even want to know them what's the purpose of knowing everyone? what's the purpose of even trying when at the end of the day I live in Seattle, Washington, and I won't see the vast majority of you ever again. And your names will fade from my memory. And that's just the truth of it. And, you know, if you saw someone who looked like me walking down the street, would you think, ah, oh, I wonder if that man went to school for English and critical theory, I wonder if he's <coughs> taught classes, been an, uh, like an underpaid educator, or 
would you say, ah, maybe he's had one too many? Or like, man, I don't know what he's on, but whatever it is, it looks like it's a blast. <laughs> you know, there are so many things and so many people that we pass by every day, not even on purpose. And we don't stop to know them because we know how little they matter. We seek out a community, but in doing so, we're just trying to find people who are like-minded, who are gonna help silence our demons and quiet the fears we have. And I've only ever found one way of quieting my, quieting my demons and trying to connect with people and that's being honest. But what sucks about honesty is most of the time it makes you sound like an asshole. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say when you were talking about most people you might not even want to get to know. The truth is, most people are assholes. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, I, I'm not, I, is that the end? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought I the freestyle you? was that cute, so I don't know. I know, I wasn't sure, but I thought maybe, maybe that's the, <laughs> <laughs> the final note. <laughs> Encore. Thank yeah, you. Also, I have no perception of time, right? <laughs> No, that was excellent. No, that was perfect. That was absolutely excellent. Thank you, Jimmy. That was great. With Why Do We Even Bother by Jimmy Lang. <laughs> Thanks for calling us into the space, mate. <laughs> I love you, Jimmy, and I can attest that you walk very differently when you're drunk. I know. I've seen it. <laughs> I've been with you. I've been the cause of it many times. And I would be choosing you if I was with you now. So, uh, have one for me, will you? Prove them all right. <laughs> really poignant questions to ask. Like, why, why, the, why do we bother? Why do we meet with people? Why do we try and connect? And, and I, I, I mean, it's, it's really hard. Like you said, honesty makes you sound like an asshole almost all the time. But those are the moments in friendships where, those are the moments in friendships where, um, where you find the most support if you're ready to take it. And I think that we're all kind of in a societal moment of that where we're all seeing how much our, our world looks at us and cares about us about it, about it, and about it. Um, really being able to actively engage with some of those deeper, darker places um, about why. And, and I've been able to answer a few of those questions for myself in the last few months. And there's a, a mixture of kind of bleak responsibility and also like, joy because i can't be as joyful on my own as i can with this guy in the room or with you or with any of you it's impossible i'm just not that interesting contrary to popular belief um <laughs> anyway thanks jimmy speaking of great class to assholes <laughs> I'll, I'll raise my water bottle to assholes. Oh, that's so sweet. What were you saying, <laughs> I'm raising enough of a glass for everyone. Yes, good. <laughs> Cheers, folks. In honor of that, I'm going to open some champagne. Do it! An asshole. Oh, I appreciate God. the comment. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Stacy, what do you reckon? Should we head on into our, to our second? I think storyteller? that we should. So I'm going to introduce our next storyteller, who is Cheryl Durant. 
Cheryl Duran has been the resident garden manager at Kelly Street Gardens since 2016. She is also the food and nutrition coordinator for New Roots Community Farm managed by the International Rescue Committee. She's an urban farmer, educator, and food justice advocate, and a 2015 graduate from Farm School NYC. Her work has included developing community-based urban agriculture projects and providing expertise and technical assistance for gardens within supportive housing developments. Cheryl has led workshops and spoken on issues related to urban agriculture and food justice for many organizations. As a former Design Trust Fellow for the Farming Concrete Project, she is now responsible for communications and outreach for this data collection platform that helps urban farmers and gardeners measure the impact of their work. She is also a board member of Open Source Gallery. Everybody, please welcome Cheryl Durant. Cheryl! Hello, everybody. Hello! <laughs> so, um, the next time somebody calls me an asshole, I am going to say, I'm going to be honest. Yes. <laughs> I like that. I like that last presentation. That was pretty good. So um, the question of alignment, I I um I've been contemplating it since um Stacy gave me the word, and um I think I I'm gonna approach it from a different angle. So I'm gonna start off with um, the Oxford Dictionary definition of alignment. It's an arrangement in a straight line or in correct or appropriate relative positions or a position of agreement or alliance. And um, when I read that definition, I was like, that's about how we as humans lead our lives. We want everything to be in a straight line. We always want everything to connect from one dot to the next. And um, if our work, if our world does not um, travel in that particular trajectory. Um, we either are depressed. We either um, find our consider ourselves failures or a myriad of other things. And I started to think about why that is. And of course, um, it's the society we live in. It's the economic system that we live in. Hypercapitalism. It's the society that um, values um, individuality over community and well-being. And it is the reason why we are here in this pandemic and we are a nation collectively um, isolated from the rest of the world, collectively depressed. And actually a lot of us are, and a lot of us are um, totally disconnected from, from reality. So, I can't hear Somebody myself. There's something in the background. Yeah. Somebody yeah. needs to mute themselves. And because her car was Joanna, like, did you know who that, that is? Jo Joanna. Oh, Joanna. Okay. I muted her. Okay. And Sorry, Cheryl. Go ahead. So um, in thinking about alignment, um, I thought about it for myself in relation to where we are now. And um, for me, there are four parts. Number one is alignment to myself and my body. And what does that mean? And since the pandemic, um, the stresses of doing my own work and the stresses of living in society are so great because the pressure is to return to normal as soon as possible. And I like um, in introducing Stacy that you know you have come up with this not not the new normal but the next normal i think that's brilliant i think it, it, it's so appropriate and my resistance to the getting back to normal is that normal was dystopian and dysfunctional and that's why we are here and i resist i will resist with every every fiber of my being going back to going back to normal so my my um take on alignment to self and body is to stop. My resistance is to not keep going on. My resistance is to not trying to find a way to do it a different way so that we can still have the same outcome. My resistance is in order to be aligned with self and body, I need to come to a full stop, um, place myself in a mirror, 
for self-observation, mm -hmm. to understand where I am, who I am, and what I need to do to discover what true alignment and centering of self really means. And um, I've come to the conclusion that that is my journey for the rest of my life. And I am fine with that. And I don't need an answer. I am fine with not having the answer. I'm fine with it being a journey of discovery because I am I'm kind of fed up with the way we have, the way I have been taught and told how to live my life. I am fed up with how I'm, ta I'm told to traverse the world and how to interact with folks. And being a woman, black immigrant, um, that is even triply hard because um, made to feel like the other and relegated to lesser and having to live up to some utopian or dystopian ideal is not where, not after this pandemic is where I want to be traversing to. So that brings me to the second alignment, which is alignment with my close circle of friends, allies, families, and my immediate environment. And that also means in looking inward, I have to also look outward. And I have to take off the rose-tinted glasses and actually begin to see people for who they are. And I live in the South Bronx in Hunts Point, which I'm not sure if many people know. I chose to live in this neighborhood because I do food security work. And um, this neighborhood is deemed the poorest congressional district in the United States. It is rife with trauma. It is under-resourced. It is high in poverty. It is high in, um, it is a touch point of many um, health disparities, um, domestic violence, um, high rates of the formerly incarcerated, high rates of the um, um, sexual violence, just everything about this, this area of the South Bronx, I feel it's just been dumped on. And it's also referred to as ground zero in the decade of fire. And if nobody knows about the decade of fire, there is a brilliant documentary on it. And it is the era of when, when, when people call it the Bronx was burning. Mm -hmm. And what in, in relating to my environment, I realized that even though I've been doing this food security work for a long time, I, and and know that I am I'm, I've embarked on a deeper dive of um, of of um, self observation is that I need to di deep dive even even deeper to touch even a deeper sense of empathy for the folks I um, I, I I interact with and I work with not sympathy because most folks don't need sympathy what they need is empathy and empowerment and to actually sometimes. You know, in my in in my work, I it, I tend to be that person that wants to save everybody. I tend to be that person that wants to helicopter in and fix things. And sometimes I forget that what is needed is to extend my hand down the rung and pull somebody up so that they too can be empowered and they too can feel like they're a part of um, this world. And in observing my environment, it means that I need. Wait, oh. it's on mute. Cheryl. Is to stop and listen. And I'm not always be talking. So um, uh, I have been, I have become more attuned to listening to people's stories. And I'm not going to um, relate any of the stories because a lot of them are very painful and a lot of them are not to be um, repeated. But it gives me a, a, a deeper sense, sense of empathy and how to just accept people for where they are and who they are. And for me, that is an alignment, alignment um, to become a whole human being so that I can include people who are not in my, not not, not on my educational level, not on my economic level, not on any level that I it would not be my normal circle of friends because we tend to do that. We tend to be prejudicial in that way, um, regardless of, of, of regardless of our skin color or economic um, 
um, status in life. We tend to encircle ourselves with folks who look like us, talk like us, act like us. And to be able to expand that circle and to embrace others who I would, on a normal, on a typical day, under normal circumstances, I would not have done. This pandemic has made me realize that this is essential in order for us to break this cycle and build, I just love that term, the new normal. And um, which brings me to the third alignment. If we can begin to embrace and include all others um, and to stop, be in front of that discomfort and listen and hear when they speak, then we can, then we can begin to align with the world. Because we're not aligned with the world in any, in, in, in any circumstances. It's why we treat it as dead. It's why every, every, our, in, our interaction with it is extractive. Um, and it is why um, we have climate chaos. It is why we have um, um, a widening economic gap and disparity. It is why we, is why to the, it's why we have Black Lives Matter after what we deemed the civil rights era. Um, it is why um, it is why we are. It is why we have um, Donald Trump as our president. It is why we have no health care. It is why our education and our food system is trash, um, because we are out of alignment with what it means to be in subjugation and stewardship to the world, um, and to care for it, because. We don't like ourselves. We are not in alignment with ourselves, and and by and by extension, therefore, we cannot be in alignment with the closest circles around us: our family, our friends, and the people who live next door. And if we become, if we are able to evolve to that paradigm or that plateau, then we can start to think about an alignment with the universe, and then we will begin to understand. And this is this is just me thinking up this word, um, <laughs> um, Stacy, and just and just you know going through thinking about it day after day, reading, you know, just expanding, being in conversation with others. That if we understand what it means to be in alignment to the world, then we can then evolve to what it means to be in alignment with the universe. And then we will understand that we are, I, then we'll understand that we are so, we are insignificant in the larger scope of the universe. And that will, that may help to humble us um, in, in a way in which um, we will begin to realize that the most important thing to us as human beings and in, in, in our um, in our spiritual and individual evolution is a constant search of who we are. And I always come back to this question, who am I? Why am I on this planet? What is my purpose here? And if I begin to internalize those questions, I will begin to see that everybody around me, everybody that I know, everybody that I touch is I, I am going to eventually lose them. They're eventually going to die from this physical place. So everything that we covet, everything, money, every um, um, status, you know, uh, material things is becomes, disappears, you know, um, 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 melts away because the only, the only thing that is important would be um, this, 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 this search for this, for what our rightful place is in the universe. And if we can continue to work on ourselves in this way, how long when we die, we ourselves die, will our um, astral bodies um, begin to, our astral bodies are, 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 are able to stay within this universe before we, before we, we disappear and are, are forgotten forever. So I feel that align. I feel that for me, alignment is to realize, to to come to a sense of um, 
um, realizing how insignificant I, I am in the face of this vast, expansive universe and to be and act a little bit more humbly. And that is it, folks. <laughs> yes! yes! Awesome. Yes! Excellent. Cheryl, that was great. <laughs> oh, so, I asked, my, my husband just I said, I don't know so if you were seeing easy. Christina like throw her arms up in the air, like swooning through half of what you were saying. <laughs> There was, there was like, there was a, Cheryl, you're marvelous. There was so many things in there that I just was like, oh, yeah, that, I align with that. But, <laughs> but like, the idea that the search for alignment is your, the way that you can be in community with people, the way that you can, like, serve people, your, your effect on the world is, is part of your alignment and also your place in it your place in this the the vast insignificance and the and the and the poignant import of your place at simultaneously is so beautiful i feel i feel that was a great great word alignment a great great it was it was a brilliant word to come up with <laughs> Made me think a lot. <laughs> and and meditated on by an amazing human being, Cheryl. Thank you. Yeah. And now you all understand why I always say that whenever Cheryl decides to run away from the city and start her farm collective, <laughs> I'm going with her. She does, she thinks I'm joking when I say it, but I am so going with her. Terrence, did, did you hear did you hear that? Terrence, did you hear that? <laughs> I'm going to be the cranky old lady on the porch telling the kids to get off my lawn and knitting and whatever, but I'm going to be wherever Cheryl is. I'm going to be the kid on the lawn, um, and I'm going to be just like, sunflowers, they're so amazing. Cheryl, tell me about the sunflowers. I just want to be with Cheryl every day of my life. Like, I just want to be around her. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, thank you both Jimmy and Cheryl for getting our storytelling off to such a fantastic start. I just appreciate both of you so much. Um, we are going to take a really short break. Uh, since we are on Zoom and not in person, we can be sort of quick about our breaks. You can go get a drink. You can go plant a seed. I don't know, whatever, whatever you want to do during, <laughs> during the next, you know, six or seven minutes. And then we're going to come back and hear a story from Momo. Momo's after the break. <laughs> Can I play some tunes so that if, if one wants to dance, one could dance? Yes, <laughs> Let's yes dance. that would be lovely. Let's dance. My my grandmother turns 95 next week and she's, wow, at, that's point, she's in Australia. She's at the point where she's like very, very beautifully and well humored, like, all right, you know, I'm 95. Are you okay? And she refers yeah. to my, my myself and my husband as the young Americans now. So <laughs> are the, she says to my mother, are you all right? And then she says, are the young Americans okay? And my mom says, yes, I'm fine. Yes, the young Americans are great. Well, there's nothing really left for me to do. How old am I going to be next week? <laughs> 95. Oh, I don't need to be any older than that. Oh, any older than that. <laughs> but ever since I heard that she refers to me as the young Americans, <laughs> I think it might be I, time. I kind of love it so much <laughs> that she calls you that. It's fantastic. She certainly does. <laughs> All right. Well, okay, so we are taking, we're officially taking a break, so I'm going to turn my camera off for a second. I'll be Take right back. Take a bite, Stacey. If you would like to do so. I'm going to share my screen with um, some tunes. Oh, oh, Stacey. Yes, I'm still can here. You, I haven't gone away Can you enable yet. screen sharing so that I can make music happen? Oh, yes, I can. I trust all of you in the room, so sure. You don't there have you to go. trust everyone, just me. <laughs> but that's dangerous. I trust all these beautiful people in the room. 
I've got such dangerous eyebrows. We should talk about <laughs> Stacy's very professional photo while she's gone. <laughs> It's not, not actually gone, but it is actually a professional photo that uh, I'm very happy to have. <laughs> it's much fancier than I normally look. My professional photo looks like I brushed my hair with a mud puddle after getting intoxicated, so <laughs> mine's just <disappeared. laughs> And it's right there on my corporate webpage, too. I don't even know what to do about it. That's what I'll try for next time. <laughs> I just have to log in. Mm. Oh, that was fantastic. I... Yeah, open stores and cut. Oh, oh that's wonderful. I love working with people with open sores and cuts. Yeah. I'm just I, saying, there's no flesh yeah. eating bacteria. It's a place to re enter the conversation. Water because of some supposed bacteria, it's salt water. It can hurt you. You should spend some time out there. Take a day. Come Take on a back, everybody. Sorry. Oh, I'm gonna oh yeah, just cut me off. Yeah. Yeah. Come on back. <laughs> I'm just bringing in a couple more people from the waiting room. We're recording again. I believe we started recording in time to get the open source and bacteria. Wonderful. <laughs> God for that. So Not open source, open source, just open bacteria. Cut. This is the age of COVID. I have a cut on the store. That... <laughs> okay. I was, I was in the water today. <laughs> and you're showing us your black eye there. Your... That's not a black eye. That's yeah. a skull. All right, pull back, pull back, honey. <laughs> too much, too much. Okay. And see, I thought we were missing nose? something by not getting to, like, I don't know, go out on the street on 17th Street. But no, we've got, we've got visual aids. We've got all kinds of nonsense. Okay, yeah. but now it's time to come back to storytelling. Tina, would you like to introduce our next storyteller? I would so love to introduce our next storyteller. Um, our next storyteller is an excellent human being, um, and I am very, very excited. Momo was with us for the first How to Build a Fire. Our very first, first How to Build a Fire, The yes. very, very, very <laughs> first one. Um, I then was working with Momo. Um, I was his boss, which is a very loose word for, like, Tr trying to get somebody else to not yell at everyone is basically my role. <laughs> um, which I did very well. Um, I did, I, I, I managed to not let this person yell at Momo specifically. <laughs> but Momo Puja hailed from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, where he is a comedian that has been featured on Showtime's Desus and Mero and MTV's Decoded. Hi. When he's not performing comedy, he can be most certainly found playing chess or procrastinating. Mm. So, Momo, your beautiful face, come into the room. Hey. Talk. Welcome. Welcome. Hello. Hi, Christina. It's so nice to see you. Hello. Yo, your hair looks fantastic. I don't think anybody's mentioned it yet, but your it's hair. So pink. Um, I your actually hair have also the same, looks fantastic. I actually have the same do. I had it. <laughs> it's 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 going poorly. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Momo Puje. Uh, I am in Philadelphia. I do do comedy. I have a funny joke that I just have to say it because if I don't get to tell this joke, I don't know the next time I'll get an audience to just listen to me. Uh, <laughs> So uh, during quarantine, I've tried to be uh, very productive, and I uh, wrote my first pilot. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll read a little bit of it. it uh, Dear pilot, what's it like flying a plane? All right. Uh, Let me see how to shut them up. Oh. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you get it on the top of this mountain? All right. Anyway, that's a really dumb joke. Um, I, I, I find myself thinking about alignment in uh, two senses. I think of it uh, first as serendipity, like the stars aligning for you and just finding yourself in a, uh, a good situation, I would hope. Uh, the other way is actually something that I've discussed with Christina, which is just standing up straight and just making sure that my posture is good. That's something that's always meant something to me. Uh, Christina mentioned something that, uh, was called Feldenkrais, which is, uh, basically like a very isometric, uh, uh, exercises or that allow you 
to sort of just move your body and process trauma almost in a way. And I guess those two angles is uh, where I'd like to tell my story from. Uh, I moved, uh, I guess serendipitously from New York in October something uh, was telling me that New York wasn't the place for me anymore. Uh, I had ended up there uh, after uh, I, moved, I graduated from college in Philadelphia. I then moved to Washington, D.C. I was there for a little bit, then I moved out to L.A. I was there for a little bit, then I moved out to Jersey. I was there for a little bit, then I ended up in Brooklyn. And I had just been there for a really long time just trying to make this comedy uh, career happen. And uh, I just found like I, I was reaching a wall uh, about uh, in, in 2017 where things were dire, things were bad. I was uh, boozing, cruising, all types of shit, fucked up. I met uh, the woman who is now my girlfriend who inevitably will be my wife. And uh, she basically just saved me from myself by making me have to acknowledge, you know, I wasn't standing up straight. Uh, she, she made sure that I stretched, she made sure that I was hydrated, made sure that I started eating vegetables, stopped smoking as much, uh, cigarettes, not weed. She's not God. She's not stopping that. Uh, <laughs> but I, I don't know. She could suffocate me in my sleep, who knows. Uh, I was um, uh, just in a bad position, but she really did come along at the right time. And uh, she was uh, the perfect antidote to a lot of the ills that I was experiencing in my life at that time. Uh, not live, not did not have a good living situation specifically. Uh, didn't really see where my future was going. A lot of these things were culminating around uh, 2017. Uh, we moved in with one another almost instantaneously. We said we loved each other almost instantaneously. We uh, we took acid with each other uh, on our second date, which is usually like a third or fourth date type of thing. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> fuck on the third date, take acid on the fourth. Uh, and I just remember being like in a very at LSD'd out moment just like Cara that's her name and I was like Cara this is fucked up she was like what is it the acid I was like no I love you and this is it like I'm gonna be with you forever like I am not there's no there's no other thing after this and I'm recognizing it right now I could see the future right now <laughs> he was like well what do you want me to do and I was like I don't know well, I don't know it was really fucked up. I made her walk home. I felt terrible about it. I still do. But uh, I knew in that moment that we were supposed to be together because she still wanted to be with me after that. <laughs> uh, uh, but we uh, we moved in with one another. And um, first, we were we moved into so many different places while we were in Queen, uh, while we were in New York City, rather. At first, we were in Cypress Hill, Cypress Hills, Queens. At the time, I was living in uh, what's that place called uh, Kensington uh, she was living in bed -Stuy. then we got together and then we moved to Cypress Hills together that obviously is a fucking shithole so we moved from there to Harlem uh, Harlem's a great place but the apartment unfortunately was a shithole and then we moved to the Bronx with each other where we just like lost an apartment very unrightfully, you know, how New York City can be. And uh, we found ourselves then in uh, Bushwick, Brooklyn, where we stayed with one another and we were with one another for like two years over that time. And we stayed in Bushwick for a year. So we moved with one another, like almost every two, three months, we were just picking up all of our belongings and dropping things off and getting rid of things. And amidst all of this, she is making me, you know, hydrate. We're shedding a lot of possessions that didn't bring us any joy. You know, the Marie Kondo aspect of living. <laughs> I consider myself to be a minimalist just because I'm poor, so I don't have to. Uh, she just uh, would get rid of things as well along the way. Um, the backdrop of all of this is my want to leave New York because of comedy, as I've mentioned. But she had, uh, she is a care, she is a teacher f first and foremost. Uh, but she also was a provider for this family uh, while she was in New York. Now, when your girlfriend is a provider for a family, you ostensibly become part of the family if she's a good caretaker because they would want to know you 
you get to know them, the children, etc. I ended up watching the children and things of that nature uh, while I was, uh, you know, while we were together. Uh, we ended up going on vacation with each other when we had finally moved to Brooklyn and it all sort of culminated and uh, we found ourselves in Canada. I had never left the country uh, and it was just me and my girlfriend, these two uh, people, uh, their children, and then two other friends of theirs. Now, in hindsight, I can say that we were there as the help. It's fucked up to see it in retrospect, but you know, I think that the biggest part of this quarantine is uh, the destruction of the great facade. I think that that's part of alignment. I know Cheryl was uh, mentioning many uh, facets of this facade that are being exposed right now. But I think the biggest aspect of it is first, obviously, the self, and then the self within a thing, and then what is that thing to you? Hopefully, you can see the communal aspects of things, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's what my, this is how my brain operates, thanks to acid. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, she was uh, caretaking for these uh, children we got there. I am not a big kid person. I'm the youngest in my family, never have had children around me. I find them to be useless in a way. Uh, <laughs> um, just, you know, in a labor type of sense. Uh, I can't manipulate them to my own end, so what's the point? <laughs> they laugh at my jokes that often. <laughs> or I, I see nothing there. So um, I've, I've just never made myself around children. I didn't know how to help hold a baby, change a diaper, but when you're seeing the future with the person, that's something that you've got to learn. So they were an opportunity for me to be around kids, learn a lot about children. I used to talk to Christina about this. I saw and met uh, Terrence, who's also here, his daughter, and interacting with her, that's always just was a good experience for me because it's like you get just field notes and take notes, just how do kids operate, what are they reacting to, what do you see in yourself, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this gets exposed. Uh, while we uh, are uh, in Canada, I realized that I like kids, I'm good with kids. Uh, the experience is so good that the parents say, you know what, uh, we, uh, we don't like New York either. And we're also trying to move. Uh, we want to move to Philadelphia. Um, do you want to move with us, basically? And uh, considering just how expensive moving is, how tumultuous it may be for us uh, to people with who are artists or she's a teacher and an artist, I'm an artist and a bum. Uh, we, uh, we have terrible credit as a result and it's so hard just to find a place, just moving out of state, so many different things that would just paper that we would have to stack that we did not have at that time. Um, it, it was just an impossibility without this, you know, serendipitous moment happening. So um, go to Canada, great vacation, they're on their, booziest, most high behavior. They basically would leave the kids with us, but we're in fucking Canada uh, on a lake, a private lake. We didn't care. Um, that fly may be them surveilling. I don't know. Um, <laughs> more, uh, anyway, tonight. All right, so we uh, end up now uh, discussing it with one another. We see that, yes, this is our opportunity to leave New York. We moved to uh, Philadelphia. This was this past October now. Uh, the moment that we got here, it was, uh, it was terrible. They tried to, we do comedy every night. I'm still trying to make it, whatever that means, um, at least by October and November standards. Uh, I was just out here just trying to tell jokes to whomever would listen to it, would allow me to be on the show, start having a mic. Uh, started uh, embedding myself in the scene, trying to be known. She did the same as well. She's very funny. Um, they would get mad at us in our independence while we were there and just sort of just throw shade, you know, at us in the house, just comment on our bodies or her body specifically, um, both of them, men and women. Um, uh, and it just became an uncomfortable situation very quickly. They would ask us to watch the children or not ask us to watch the children just leave. And, you know, I'm not trying to have child services called on them, but basically they just left us holding the bag all the time. We also had a room in a Jack and Jill type of sense that was right next to their 
children's room on this floor. It was like a four floor house. All right. And they would wake us up all the time. Typical shitty kid shit, you know, another reason not to enjoy them. Uh, but they, the, they, when we asked them, you know, is there something you could do? They have four floors. Could we encourage them to be elsewhere in the house? Uh, we were told to get earplugs. So this wasn't going to work. We, we obviously couldn't be there. Um, my girlfriend is very particular so particular that uh, all of those things about my improvement, I alluded to them as though the, the, they were willing changes. They aren't, they aren't at all. Uh, she's like, you're going to change in these ways. You need to hydrate, you need to start stretching. You need to do these things. It's gonna happen, she's particular. Things have to be in a specific order. They would move her possessions and belongings in the house. And uh, to a, a woman like her, that is unforgivable when she expects something to be in a place because she put it there. She doesn't want to spend an extra second looking for it because that's not where she put it. It's a very simple, logical thing. Uh, I'm scared to death of her, so I don't break this rule. They did not care, and it wasn't the children, it was the parents. Uh, and an opportunity to sort of put us in our place, uh, she uh, moved her stuff when my girlfriend reacted. They told uh, her that she's not really mad about her stuff being moved. She's actually mad at me. So I don't know about you, but I think that you're not allowed to talk about another person's relationship unless you want to get stabbed or shot. Like, it's just something that usually happens in the world I come from. That happens. So you don't talk about a person's relationship. They did. They crossed that line within a home that we lived in, that we couldn't enjoy our home. Well, uh, COVID happens. So while we were plotting, scheming, like, all right, we got to get out of here. It cost. We still got that whole bad credit situation. Things weren't specifically aligned. Society shuts down. Go figure. Uh, you're now forced into closer quarters with these individuals, and you have to see them more. Um, they didn't have to worry about going out or us going out to do mics and things of that nature because we were now self-contained in this home. Um, we had a meeting where we had to talk about COVID and uh, a cluster. That was a word that I only used when it came to oat, cluster of oats, like the just oats uh, box of cereal uh, or just clusters, maybe it's called. I don't know. I'm not a field rep for them. Uh, they had uh, told us that we needed to stay in the house. Now, my girlfriend is a teacher. She wanted to watch children that she watches and homeschool them and help them and keep educating them. And they refused, said that that would bring COVID into the house and that would potentially get on them. And they wanted their grandparents to get there, uh, come to the home as well. Um, and so, you know, that's something that couldn't happen. And we are very amenable people. So we were like, all right, fine. That's cool. She's going to miss out on that money. They then asked her to homeschool their children. I had a job. I would work in mental health. So I kept my office job. Nobody, everybody else in the office cleared out. So I would leave just so she could have at least the space of me not being there. But she had to just stay in the house and she soldiered and she held that shit together for all of up until you know last uh the beginning of july is when we moved out at any rate uh the thing that kind of spurred us moving out more than just all of the microaggressions and things of that nature was two specific things um as you know there's a brewing civil war or a version one and uh i I don't know what a Karen means to you, but if it was a thing that was that woman whose mm -hmm. photo of her like that, that's who this woman is, like, at heart. But she can hide it behind a lot of liberal bullshit and, you know, just a lot of progressive ideology and talk the talk and never walk the walk. And in hindsight, I find that I was a prop in her realness or maintaining some understanding of black people and look at how generous I am for black people that I don't need a favor. I can, I, I'm very smart. So it's like, I don't need a person to help me if you're doing it altruistically. Sure, I'm going to take an opportunity. I'm not an idiot, but uh, to pose me and my girlfriend in that position, highly uncomfortable. Uh, in fact, she would have conversations on FaceTime, which I'm still getting used to. Uh, 
uh, in which she would just put us on it without our consent, just to discuss topics with whomever. It was a lot. Uh, well, one day I had a Zoom show uh, and I was preparing for it after a long day. This is in June. Um, they were celebrating their anniversary and decided to celebrate it in a four-story home right outside of our door. Now, I don't know about you, but after you've had to be in close quarters with the person for so long, their anniversary really doesn't hold as much weight more than happy anniversary. Now, don't celebrate right outside of my door. Uh, that That's where it was. Uh, they were yelling. They talked. They... <laughs> Uh, I, I just feel I'm just bitching this entire time. I, I, hopefully you guys can all charge me for this session. Uh, I was, uh, I, I, it got to the point that I figured that they aren't real people. They only converse in TV talk. Now, I got my degree in screenwriting because I'm a genius. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, basically, TV talk is a very high-pitched frequency where you're talking up here and everything is on and you're always on and you're talking like, and it's whip snap. Like, it's something disingenuous about it, but it works because we want our brains to turn off. So if someone's conversing to me in TV talk and it's all up here, I just know their brain or some very specific part of the mind is off or they don't value anything that I have to say. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I asked them just to move from in front of my door. They refused. They said, hey, uh, what, do you have a show tonight? And I said, yes, I do. They said, no, it will be a minute. We text them. We say, hey, you know, we, fi we feel like that's a lot. We do have shows tonight, but if you could just leave. I'm sweating because I'm angry. I apologize. Uh, uh, if you could just not be there, uh, be in front of our door. We do have a four-story home, as you know, um, and we only have this room. They would bogart the kitchen and living room. I don't have to go into all every detail of how awful this living situation was, but uh, we asked them at the breaking point, please just don't fucking be outside my door. You know how like those firecrackers were going off all the time uh, from the government, but uh, those firecrackers were going off continuously. Um, imagine that like centralized to being right in front of your bedroom door. And it was a lot. And it was not just kids. It was a, a man who stuttered. And I have nothing against people who stutter, but you know, he's buffering while he's being loud. And it was a lot. It, it, it just got to the point where it just drove me insane. So um, I asked them, please, I need you to get out from in front of our door. We texted them just so that we didn't ruin their anniversary. And they texted back to us, if this is actually a big deal to you, why don't you talk to us about it? I have a Zoom show, I'm trying to be funny. I hate where I live and to muster something inside of you to make people laugh, take something, especially now that I'm disconnected and I'm in this situation. All these things flooding through my mind. I'm like, bro, all you have to do is just fake apologize to me. You could have just been like, my bad, and that's it. Yeah, 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 I would have been sufficient. But when the facade is destroyed, you just realize that uh, they're incapable of actually being real people. It has to be all TV shit. They wanted to have some sort of real moment where we have a talk. I'm uh, a, not necessarily a violent person, but I'm not for talking if I don't believe a resolution is going to be had. Um, if you want to, I, I've just seen where these talk, type of talks go to, it usually ends up in violence. Like people are like, you know, I'm angry. I'm angry. I have this point of view. I have this point of view. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to back down. And then violence occurs. Like there's no, it escalates and escalates. And then either you walk away or it's going to turn to violence. And I'm not trying to beat the, this nigga the fuck up in our home. That's weird. Uh, so I try to walk away from the situation. Uh, I go downstairs to try to do my Zoom show. I get buried on the Zoom show just because I'm late having this moment occur. Uh, I finally am going downstairs and they finally now gone downstairs and a grown man tried to stop me from doing my Zoom show. I don't do well with a person telling me what to do, but then I realized just what that situation must have been for my girlfriend and what she was always constantly texting me about, about being cornered and being told that you can only be here, being in the right spot, where what space is yours, where what, do, what belongs to you. And so she would always be stressed out. She would always stretch. She would teach me just like a way to stretch and how to stand in order to get oxygen to go to my brain so that I can consider in a moment what I am doing so I don't react 
poorly. And in that moment of being stopped going downstairs, I just said, that is not your space. It's not your place to do such a thing. Walk downstairs. Wu sad myself out, told a similar pilot joke. It was about selling a script, but the script is Oxycontin in the fucking suburbs. Hilarious. I right, think it's great. Uh, while I'm trying to perform, I'm hearing things occur upstairs. And so I look at my phone and this man has texted me a novel. And I'm, he's saying that if you don't want to have a talk right now, I wish that you would move out sooner. And so I said, if I could move out in this very moment, I would. Um, I was waiting for, I'm waiting for an apartment to be clean. I had no place at the time. This is like July or June 15th. Um, uh, I'm now at the point where I'm like, all right, got to get the fuck out of here. Got to find an exit strategy. I text what uh, he just sent to me to my girlfriend just to show her what was up. And she uh, storms downstairs and an argument commences. So what people don't understand is that she's actually the bad cop and I'm the good cop. And so things weren't in the right place. She said that that was out of pocket. If you know what out of pocket means, like your wallet, et cetera. She was like, that's not where it's supposed to be. Things are not how they should be. And she just unloaded on these people. She's, I've never heard her say fuck you to a person's face with such vehemence, but it was beautiful. No, she just unloaded on them. How she taught their children how to read, taught them how to potty train, has been there. Uh, held them down and homeschooled them, taught, uh, you know, just has been everything, cooks for them, does so many things. And she's not supposed to be the help, but that's how that they've been treated. And in a moment where we could just be treated how we want to be, uh, we weren't uh, valued. We weren't given, you know, any deference whatsoever. Uh, so we uh, said, fuck you, two middle fingers type shit, left. Uh, for the night, we just walked, we smoked a joint, uh, we stretched in the park, and while we were stretching and commiserating with one another about our situation, she was just like, you know, biblically, something like this is, like, meant to happen, like, while we're breathing and aligning, we're just, like, trying to let go of this moment, just like, you know, we have this thing where we, uh, act like you're washing your face, and then you or you're, you're washing your face and you're, then you tussle your hair and you push it out. You're supposed to like do it on both sides until you can feel your traps and whatever loosen up your chest and these muscles can relax. And I just feel like it all like coming out of my pores and out of my skin, out of my palms, and I'm getting less angry. She's like, it's not where we're supposed to be. We need to move. Uh, I just believed in myself. She tried to find some places, none of it worked, trying to do it the legit route. Uh, I just, I was knees on the ground praying to God, like, help me. I need help right now. Like, right now. I need to get out of this. Like, me and her will not coexist, survive in this household. We, they've shown us who they are. Like, imagine, like, the microcosm of that situation and the macrocosm of the society in which we inhibit, where that facade is being, like, exposed and explored by so many people in so many different ways people now know who what their value is people now know i cannot and will not accept to be treated that way i will not engage in space in that way why should i may be made to feel awkward for anything for anything like i am a great person i've done nothing wrong to anyone ever literally it sounds like you were in a real cinch oh yeah it was trash well we found ourselves uh, uh an apartment uh, luckily, took a video, I walked in, the guy who met me shook my hand while we, sh we shook hands, and then I offered him hand sanitizer, and he laughed, uh, took a tour of the place, I'm in our bedroom right now, we need to get art on the wall and things of that nature, but you know, we spent like this last day uh, basically cleaning and saging the house and saging our lives and putting things in its place. And I mean, serendipitously, everything fits. Every color, our aesthetic, our neighbors are cool as shit. One tried to sell me Xanax. I don't take that shit, but whatever, just to know it's air. It's good cool. to know you've got neighbors, you know? Yeah, yeah man. They're super cool. <laughs> whatever they do, at least they're around. 
yeah, man, they're like there. They watch our packages like very hard when we're not there. We've had tons of stuff come in. I just got like my first, uh, what are those kitchen mixers and stuff? So I'm going to start doing some baking. Uh, while doing some baking, you know I mean, bro? Uh, uh, dude, uh, we got a food processor. Nah, it's just like things that I didn't conceive of, like the future that in that moment of seeing where things are going to go. Like manifesting it right now and uh we've blocked them we don't talk at all the last two weeks like imagine like senioritis or like you breaking up with a person but you didn't really break up with that or maybe you even did and you have to like be still live with them as you're running out the clock and man it was that to the 10th level these motherfuckers were pathetic trying to send all types of hail mary sorries and shit and it's like once i say fuck you to your face that's a rat. Like, there's not really much you could do because it's like, I would never say that to another human being's face without thinking it's going to resort in violence. But if I'm, I'm going saying- to take, take you right there at yeah. once I say fuck, to, fuck you to your face, that's a wrap. It's over. It's over. <laughs> um, <laughs> me and my Hello. girlfriend, we stretch every day. And that's where we are. We stretch out. We now have our own space. Perfect, You've man. got your own space. And yeah. that's, that's strong and beautiful. And something that takes a whole lot of work as um as has been forced upon you yeah because like i think i think this country has a narrative that's like you know you work for the betterment of yourself and that's just not true like you work to get where people assume you should be Mm -hmm. and that just doesn't work out like a lot of the time like most of the time, that's why it's a dream. <laughs> yeah. Where are you? Where are you now? Like you've got you've got good neighbors. Back in Philly, uh, I'm in South Philly now, and I grew up in West Philly. Uh, oh. Raised, not born. Uh, I I never lived in South Philly. It was sort of uh, very, uh, I guess, segregated. Honestly, some you just didn't go there. That's it was mm-hmm. the white part of town. But uh, I'm here. There's neighbors of all races and ethnicities and types of people. Um, it's just a beautiful situation. Uh, we do want to move again, just because this was a. Uh, it was serendipitous, but it wasn't the final landing place. Um, we want to ultimately move to Atlanta, uh, still. Um, or if that's not the move, if God says move out to LA, and that makes sense. California is not the place to be right now. Moving to Atlanta and Georgia is also not the place to be. And moving is not entirely feasible. So I think right now, this lockdown is just like, get it together, Momo, figure it out. You have a moment to sit and learn, look inside. The answer is there and go from there. There's a moment to sit and learn and look inside and to stand up for who you are as well, as you had to do in a four story home. Yeah. Which, which other people, like you said, used, you said used you as a prop. I, I understand how that feels in a very different way, but yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you for sharing. Thank you, yo. Thank you for letting me talk about it. I owe everybody, I'll give you my insurance card. Hopefully you take Mama! Mama! Free therapy. <laughs> Thank you, Momo. I love you, Momo. Hello, how are you? Hi, <laughs> Hey, Momo. That's very good. Oh my God, this is what? Yeah, if you've if you've got a spare, like you know. Um. All right, Stacy. Okay. Now we so, shall we move it? Yes. I'm just pulling up Shalewa's bio. Here we go. So I'm going to introduce uh, Shalewa McCall, who is, uh, like Cheryl, a return, and like Momo also, actually, a returning storyteller. Shalewa told uh, a story when we were still meeting at Open Source, and I'm really glad she's back. So here is Shalewa's bio. Shalewa McCall is an artist and educator dedicated to liberatory creative practice. Towards that end, she celebrates all things good and black. 
Her poetry was included in the 2019 edition of the 50 and 50 project in New York and Los Angeles, and in the 2019 Visible Poetry Project. She is a 2019 Poets House Emerging Poets Fellow. She has more than 30 years experience teaching, performing, and creating in traditional and contemporary African diaspora dance forms and founded Movement for the Urban Village Dance Company, MUV. She bakes pies, which are delicious. I have had many of them. <laughs> Teaches <laughs> and develops projects, joining movement and poetry in the film. Everybody, please welcome Shalewa. Yes, Shalewa! I'll spotlight you now. Hello, everybody. Good evening. It's really um, wonderful to be here. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, Stacy, for inviting me back. Uh, alignment is really, really interesting for me. I am a dancer and I have a curvy body and knees that kind of drift towards each other but don't quite kiss. So finding alignment in my body has been a lifelong project. For me, that often involves taking deep breaths, getting still, and replaying internal recordings of some of my teacher's instructions. Things like, imagine yourself wearing a corset. Zip it up. Pull your waist back. Spread your wings. And most importantly, remember to save some of your heart for yourself. But mostly, it's taken many decades of practice. Another way that I kind of enter into a conversation with alignment is thinking about the last few years of my grandmother's life when I was her caregiver. And for the eight years that I was doing it, there were many ups and downs and cycles and things that happened that seemed unfair or too much. But mostly, I was able to put one foot in front of the next and one day in front of the next and ultimately I would spend eight years with her. The last two years of that experience I had a kind of a theme song. It was a sonic talisman with a mantra that gave me so much solace. It was everything in its right place by Radiohead. Mm -hmm. Just breathing and listening and wondering about Kid A. <laughs> but also connecting to the kind of truth inside of the lesson of the lyric that everything is in its right place. Over time, I learned about lots of different covers of the song. Robert Glasper in his more acoustic straight ahead guys has a version. Uh, the Vitamin String Quartet mm -hmm. has a version. Another jazz pianist, Brad Meldow. Uh, a really excellent uh, Deep House version by Ocean Nade and Eric Roberson. All of the versions <laughs> in my earbuds all the time reminding me, even without lyrics, that everything was in its right place. I'm one of the people who is a member of the congregation of people who are spiritual but not religious. And it became kind of my grounding dogma for that last transitional period with my grandmother and forward into the nine years since she's transitioned. 
I keep it close to me. Because sometimes I don't always know what's going on, but I've learned to trust everything is in its right place. So the last time I was at How to Build a Fire was exactly five days before I got the news that I had endometrial cancer. Last time I was there, I don't know if uh, the people who were there last time, but some of the people on this call have known me for a while, so they knew me with big hair. So I had big hair then. And I had practiced my How to Build a Fire story in a creative process workshop that I was leading. And on the evening of the very last creative process workshop, before I left my teaching job in Brooklyn Heights and moved on to Park Slope for my creative arts workshop facilitating, I stepped out of the faculty lounge and decided based on all the things that had been happening and all the tests that I've been taking, even though I was really, really sure that I was not gonna have cancer, my doctor was being extra, just in case to get a flu shot for the first time in my life because I was getting on a plane that next morning. I was away from my phone for five minutes tops. But in that five minutes, I got a phone call and an email that gave me the information before anybody could speak it to me that I did indeed have cancer. I clearly looked stricken and colleagues who were in the faculty lounge doing various things, hanging out late before they headed home themselves, um, including all of my best friends at work. I don't think that there was any other time in the entire school year that all of us were in the same place at the same time, but it happened that we were the only people in the faculty lounge and they literally caught me. They came and put hands on me and sat me down, reminded me to breathe. Most of them are also theater and dance teachers. So they reminded me about my breath and my alignment. They gave me hugs. And they sent me out to the workshop where I got everything together. It was our finale. There were a few guests. And just as I had been practicing the story that I told at How to Build a Fire in October, I told a story of how I had just found out I had cancer. And it was really interesting to find that I had language and I could laugh about it and people could hear it and not mostly say, oh, poor thing, but check in and give me some energy and help me know that it was going to be okay telling the other people in my life who I needed to tell. So I made it home, it was a really rainy night and I was drenched and it was not yet the season of the Zoom. So I didn't tell everybody face to face. I wrote my parents, my siblings and my innermost circle of best friends an email and I said, I can't talk to any of y'all, but this is what's happening. They all knew that I was doing the testing and I went to sleep and I got up and I had to be at JFK by 5 a.m. to get on my flight to go to Detroit the next morning. So I set my alarm for 4 a.m. thinking I'll just throw some things in the bag. I was not as together as I had imagined 
myself the night before, thinking I had handled everything. I'd sent out a couple of emails. Everybody knew what was going on. I washed all the clothes. Everything was ready. Just had to put a few things in the bag and roll out. I sat down and I lost time. The right place for me in that moment, apparently, was deep in meditation. And before I knew it, it was 4.55 and there weren't very many things in my bag. So I dumped my carry-on into my full-size suitcase so I didn't have to be strategic. I was flying JetBlue. That meant I had a free bag. And <laughs> by 4.10, excuse me, 5.10, I'm packed. I'm ready. <laughs> what do you mean it's going to cost me $100 to get to JFK? <laughs> there was an Uber surge on. That was not the right place. No. But as I mentioned at the very beginning of this gathering, I'm in the southeast corner of Crown Heights. And at or something in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, it only takes like 20 minutes to get to JFK. I waited. I waited. The air came down a little bit. It didn't come down that much. I was like, eh. I was on a tighter expense budget than usual for this trip because it had been squeezed at the last minute out of another program at my school. But I was going to hang out with the good people at the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute. And I was gonna be in community with wise and brilliant and generous people. And I needed community with wise and brilliant and generous community. So I just figured I'd make breakfast every morning instead of eating out or something and pay the extra. The car comes, things happen. The short version is, to check my bag, I needed to be at the check-in counter at 5.20. I arrived at 5.22. I might have mentioned full-size suitcase, not carry-on. I was missing my flight. It was hard. It was frustrating. It was exactly the right place. I watched everybody get on the plane that I had originally planned to be on. And the gate agent asked me, you're not getting on the plane? You know, we're about to close the door. And I explained how my bag hadn't made it. And I had to wait several hours. And I found myself sitting in a neutral space, listening to the ocean watching the planes, again, deep in meditation, quiet and still, and integrating the news that I was going to be losing my uterus, and who else knew it was ahead. In that time, I started writing what would, over the course of my time in Detroit, moving through emergent strategy facilitator training, become my vision statement for my community health. There are a number of people on this call who have shown up for me in many beautiful ways and other people who had to leave us. But the visioning happened because I missed the flight, because I wasn't doing everything, because I wasn't running for just a few minutes. I was still. Got to Detroit, got in the room, had sent word ahead to a few people, got a strong, sturdy hug from one of my cousins who was doing the facilitation training with me. She had decided only a couple of days prior that she was gonna be there. 
And I didn't realize it till I was being held by someone who is in my family that I needed them. And she was there. My oldest, dearest college friends live in Detroit. And they came and scooped me up. Didn't know I needed people who knew me when I said my name the old way. Some of you know what that means, but mostly it's mystery. I like a little mystery every now and then. I needed that. They fed me fancy vegan desserts and held me while I cried a little. And the big circle, we spent four days thinking about how to shape change in community and in collaboration. And it helped me to keep developing that little seed of writing that had started at the gate while I watched my flight go. And I understood that I had to let things go, even things that I had planned for, even things that I thought were my own. But sometimes that's not the right place. That's not the right time. That's not the right alignment. I am, as of today, officially uh, closing out my second month of being cancer free and my first month of being in my own home. There were many, many, many circumstances and tiny alignments that turned out to be great blessings across the journey. For instance, I live in a brownstone up a few flights of stairs and anybody who knows anything about abdominal, abdominal surgery knows that stairs aren't the easiest thing. So the beginning of my treatment found me in Manhattan in an elevator building with my dad and my stepmom. And turns out getting on the subway early in the morning in the snow in winter in New York is not a good way to get to one's cancer treatments on time. So I stayed a little longer. As it happens, when we had to shelter in, I was with my parents. And what we had planned as a short visit turned into seven months of being in community and being held and being in alignment in a way that I would never have asked. Having this experience of sheltering in meant that when I was going through my period of need for greater kinds of support and accommodation, everybody needed to develop different kinds of skills and modes of being together. And I got to benefit from that and I was able to work through treatment and be on fun Zoom gatherings with Sharice in a poetry workshop and Radia and many writing workshops and Stacy, and to find all kinds of alignments in the everyday. I am so grateful for the message in that weird song. <laughs> I am so grateful for the alignment that brings me here today to hear stories about critical theory after spending a week doing uh, critical race theory summer school. Mm. 
and to hear about all kinds of alignment coming from Hunts Point, one of my family's home places and neighborhoods in the city, to hear about stepping out in different ways, sometimes not because you were ready or willing exactly, but because it was the demand of the moment. And every step I know is in its right place, in its right time, and in its right alignment. Thank you. Johnny! Thank you, Shalewa. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. Wow. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, great. Just uplifting. That's awesome. Can I can I tell you through my through my I lost my virginity to Kid A. <laughs> what is happening right now? What? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Christina, your mother's listening. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> my mother is listening. <laughs> Shall leave my mother. So beautiful. I Thank do remember you. a lot of Radiohead. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of my favorite albums too. Oh, For different reasons. Hi Mary. <laughs> Hello Stacy. What an amazing, beautiful story. Yes. Thank you, Shaliwa. No, <laughs> Shaliwa, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. I don't want to see you want you to see me making really weird faces. So I just <laughs> You got all my weird faces. <laughs> oh, so after all of these wonderful stories, we have one more storyteller who I'm really thrilled to introduce. Um, and I hope everyone can stay. I know we're running a little long tonight. Our final storyteller tonight is Shawnee Benton Gibson. Shawnee is the co-artistic director for Big Apple Playback Theater. She's an actor, vocalist, composer, poet, author, and playwright who has incorporated music and the arts into every aspect of her 29-year career as a clinician, healer, and activist. Ms. Benton Gibson is a psychodramatist and sociometrist who utilizes the power of storytelling and enactment to assist individuals, groups, and communities with sharing their lived experiences for the purposes of healing and transformation. She has been a principal actor in various productions, including The Moth, A Suite, A Healing Journey, a reenactment of the transatlantic slave trade, and traveled with the touring company from 1995 to 2007. She is also the co-writer, producer, and director of a choreo poem entitled Mother Wit, Echoes from the Womb, a piece that addresses the darker side of reproductive health. Everyone, please welcome Shawnee Benton Gibson. Uh, Yes! Our spotlighted Shawnee. Yes! Lady. So, folks are now drunk, tired, <laughs> and ready to get the hell up out of here. So now I have to speak. This is so great. Thank you, Stacey. <laughs> oh, man. So, um, I'm so delighted to be here um, with all of you and back for the second time. The first time was in live space. And it was an intimate space and there was confetti everywhere and we were throwing it and I had it put That's right. That was a confetti night. Over. Um, just amazing. And um, I love a space where stories can be shared. And you know, I always say that stories make up the threads. Um, uh, well, actually the threads that make up the tapestry of our lives. So I will not keep you long. Um, what I will do is start with the title or the container um, for this offering, how to build a fire. So I had all these thoughts and emotions around what I would share tonight. And I'm, I'm over here pinching myself. I'm over here tickling the roof of my mouth. I'm like, girl, don't you cry, don't you cry. But I'm like, what I tell everybody is tears are libation. And so tears come up and out of me, but I feel them like welling up, welling up, welling up. I'm building the fire of my tears right now by just, um, sharing what I'm sharing. 
Um, but it's all part of it. It's all part of living. It's all a, all a part of creating this space that we call alignment. Um, my li alignment has been activated by losses and grief and trauma, and then also the good stuff of healing, um, pleasure and joy, living my purpose. Purpose. Um, it's just been an amazing journey. And so I'm grateful to all of you, and I pour the libation if they come. You know, I ask that you receive them on behalf of my ancestors and my clan on both sides. I call the name of my mother, Jill, um, whose womb space I emerged from, the fiery energy of her womb, her 15-year-old plus womb. And I'm just grateful that the universe aligned so that my mother and father could come together so that this being that you're listening to right now could emerge and live the life that I'm living with all of the messy shit um, things that I've done to hurt people, things that I've done to hurt myself, um, hurtful things that have done, been done to me, all of it has me be here and all of it has me be a healer and all of it has me be a writer and a singer and a composer and all the stuff that's in that bio that doesn't mean shit, um, but has given me a meaningful, meaningful life. And um, what comes up for me right now is that my alignment um, you know, is connected to three birthday stories and one rebirthday story in the form of a death. So I'm going to say that again, my alignment, and I was already, you know, on course and doing, I'm, I've been doing my purpose work for a very long time, but my full blown alignment, me feeling fully grounded in myself is connected to three birthday stories and one rebirth day story in the form of a death or an ascension or a transition. So last October, I lost my eldest child. Yeah. <laughs> last October, I lost my eldest child. And when I say it out loud, I'm like, oh my gosh, last October, I lost my eldest child. She was 30 years old, beautiful woman, um, vibrant annoying as hell, um, would call me 30 times a day to share ideas, um, just to say, hey, ma, see what I was up to. Um, lived in my home way longer than she should have, I say. Um, she didn't leave my home until she was 27. And I was steadily telling her, to, you got to get the fuck out, like on a regular basis. Um, you know, not always delivered in that way, but sometimes <laughs> in my mind, saying it nicely, but in the, my mind, I'm like, you got to get the fuck out. <laughs> um, you know, showing her rent stuff, places for rent, rooms, um, <laughs> garages and people's backyards, like anything. It's like, it's time for you to spread your wings and launch and fly and go. And her steady refrain or um, a conversation was that, you know, this is New York and it's too hard for anybody to, have an apartment and live on their own. So when I was listening to Momo um, and his share and then listening to the other sister, her name escapes me right now. I'm like, uh, a lot of things are swirling around in my head about um, living in the boogie down Bronx and you know why living there. Just thinking about um, what my daughter Shimani would say about why she couldn't exit stage right, left, through the trap door from my space. And um, when she finally did leave, um, it was as a result of her co-creating new life in her womb with her mate, Omari. And um, just thinking about alignment and how it can show up in such a crooked, um, over-the-top, accidental way, right? But accidentally on purpose, right? Because everything is divinely orchestrated and aligned. And, um, but I forget sometimes, especially when it flips my belly and it takes me there. So when I think about the container of fire and how to build a fire, I've, I've been building a fire since I was born, since I was in my mother's womb. 15 year old mom, 16 year old dad, um, her depression while she was pregnant, her depression when she gave birth to me. This fire has been amplifying over the course of this life that I've been living and it started in my first house, which was my mother's womb. And it's all about alignment. It's all about bringing me to a space of deep understanding of myself and how the world works and how you can be knocked to your knees and still get up, scabs and bloodiness and stitches and gaping holes and crustiness and all of that can lead you and me 
and others to a space of deep connection, um, deep understanding and under understanding. And so I get back to October of last year, three birthdays, one rebirth day in the form of death. My daughter went into labor on October 20th with her second child. Um, little boy, we were very excited. She had, you know, had a girl that was two years old at the time of her going into labor and then waiting for the boy to arrive. Did everything that you can think that a person could do and drove all of us crazy doing it, studying. She was a research person. Her anxiety would make her look up things and just make sure that she had all her ducks in a row. She had a doula, she had a midwife, she was using herbs, she was exercising, she was talking about what she needed to do. She wanted to have a V-back. She researched, researched that for those who don't know it was vaginal birth after C-section because she had a C-section with the first grandchild. Um, so in constant motion around the emotion of being a mother for the second time and just preparing, painting and buying things and just really, really being aligned, right? With making sure that the birthing process for herself and this new baby coming into the world would be a powerful and um, spiritual thing. And so when she went into labor on the 20th, I had left her home and she was saying she didn't feel so well. I'm like, but if you're not, if it's time, let's do this. And she called me back and I was so tired and I came back to our house. And you know, as soon as I walked through the door, it's like, oh, my mom is here, my water can break. So water broke, it's all around her feet. We're helping her and you know, in the process unfolds and then her, her labor pains stopped. She wanted to have a home birth. Um, that didn't work out. We had to go to the hospital because she wasn't progressing. And they tried to work with her to have a vaginal birth and that didn't work out. So she ended up having a C-section, which she agreed to. And without getting into all of the details, um, she had a C-section, she was discharged from the hospital. Um, like I said, all alignment, even though her plan didn't work out, this is the plan. This is the sacred script that she agreed to. And while it's hard for me to wrap my brain around, it's like, yo, she agreed to before she got here to, end, you know, to have her life be shortened and to have a baby and then to exit through the trap door of maternal mortality. And so um, I said three birthdays. So my grandson, Kari, was born on the 23rd of October. He held out to be a Libra. I'm a Libra. My daughter loved Libras. Her mate is a Libra. And so my birthday is October 1st. His birthday is October 11th. So the baby was born on September 23rd. A little over a week later, my birthday comes. My daughter's experiencing discomfort. You know, she had a C-section. She's, you know, they stayed, gave her staples, all this stuff. She's struggling during this recovery process. And last time she was like quick back on her feet. And we're talking about that, negotiating that. My birthday came off 51st. What I will say, just about fire and alignment. I had a big 50th celebration. So I was cool with just chilling on my 51st birthday. And so that night I was like, oh, I'm just gonna sleep. I'm gonna take it easy. Like I still feel the, the afterglow of my 50th celebration, even though it was, it was a year ago. I went on Facebook, I saw some note that said, oh, who knows about Deepak Chopra's work, blah, 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 blah. I wrote a note, it was like, I do, and went to sleep. Um, the next morning, well, I will back up, talking about alignment. Um, I had been doing the abundance meditation, Deepak Chopra's abundance meditation, and it was the eighth day. So did that, did my exercise, all that stuff on my birthday, chilling. Got a call, I mean, a Facebook message from the person who I had said, I do, I know about Deepak. And she reached out and was like, oh, you know, I wish you would have told me yesterday because we need somebody for the Dr. Oz show to talk about the experience with Deepak's work. Um, but, you know, it's, it's happening in a couple of hours. I was like, hold up. <laughs> I'm, doing this, I'm doing this meditation. I'm manifesting. It's talking about abundance. If you'll have me, I'll jump in an Uber and I will come now. She was like, if you can get here in an hour, come on with it. Was there in an hour in makeup? preparation to be on Dr. Oz's show with Deepak Chopra, who I was hearing through my ears in meditation for the last eight days and have done many of his things before with Oprah, um, but doing them virtually and just listening and now being the audience or not in the, on stage with him. So alignment and manifestation. My life is moving in that direction, but fire is a funny fucking thing. Fire can simmer 
and help things to cook up so you can eat. Fire can also burn the shit out of you. Fire can warm you on those days when you're feeling like you're freezing and you can't take it and it can just provide enough heat to cover you and feel like a cloak over your body. So three birthdays, one rebirth day. My daughter had symptoms, um, which I felt were a pulmonary embolism, but I was just trying to negotiate space with her. She seemed like she was better the next day after we talked about it. Um, on October 5th, I went to visit her. Visit, visit her. My aunt was there. Um, my goddaughter was there. The babies were there. She's breastfeeding. Her maid is there, Omari. And she started to feel sick and said she needed to go to the hospital. And immediately I'm like, it's a pulmonary embolism. Um, like I said, without getting into all the details, she was rushed to the local hospital. Fire. Oof, the fire of disenfranchisement, the fire of inequity, the fire of divestment from communities of color. She was taken to a hospital that didn't have the resources. And so even though I knew what was happening to her, or, or my cousin, who's also a doctor, I was like, tell them she came from Manhattan. We all converged at the space at the hospital. I won't name it right now, but I don't need to name it. It's any hospital in a marginalized community where they've taken resources out and we still have to go there because we're trying to live, right? Trying to live in a space that is about death. So she's there because it's the closest hospital to where they live in Bed-Stuy. And it's wild because the fire of gentrification and then the fire of divestment, all living in one space, percolating all under one sky. And so my daughter lasted 14 hours, coded seven times. And I'm like, what the fuck? Deepak on the first, death on the sixth. Two birthdays, the 23rd, my grandbaby, boy. The first, my 51st birthday. Um, rebirth day and transition on the 6th of October. And then her mate's birthday on the 11th of October, which was also the day we buried her. Fire is a funny thing. <laughs> it's a funny thing. Because what got activated in me, I was already doing reproductive justice work is that my daughter was a sacrificial lamb to take the work to the next level. Fire is a motherfucker. It can move shit. It can get you activated. It can get you motivated. It can transform you into an activist or an advocate or a writer or a lover. Fire is a motherfucker. But it's also creating activation in my organs right now as I speak to you. It's churning my belly. It's recreating and generating cells in my body right now. It's firing my brain so I can tell this story. Fire is a motherfucker. And it's also a blessing. And so that death has opened up a, a space for me to be able to take the platform of the reproductive health work that I was already doing to the next level. And my daughter is talking to me every day. She's talking to me through the three birthdays, because that was one of our numbers, 3333. Three, three, three. Her number is nine. Her numbers are also 19, because she was born on December 19th. Um, her number's 12, 1111. Um, All those activating energies. She shows them to me every single day. I'm here, Ma. I'm here with you. Keep talking. If you can't talk, I'm going to jump on in you. I'm going to fire you up, and you're going to channel me into the spaces so that the voices of these mothers who are on the side with me senselessly can be heard. Fire is a motherfucker, but it's transformed my life. And it's given me a relationship with my daughter that I would have never had um, with her being alive because she's in her purest form, fired up and ascended in this awesome way. Three birthdays, September 23rd, October 1st, Deepak Chopra, Dr. Oz activated from my, my jumping in the Uber and being fired up to go someplace, going not knowing, fired up all over the place. Fire is everywhere. It's, I lost my virginity today. I was diagnosed with cancer. I was born with cerebral palsy. palsy. I was um, in a home where I was being misused and abused. Fire is in it all. It's a motherfucker. And it's my motherfucker because it's taken me to the next level of my life and my living. I'm so, so grateful. 
And what I will finally say, because my daughter, once again, still living in my space, she moved to another plane, but her ass is still living in my house. <laughs> She's still living here. She comes and she invades all the time. And she reminds me that I am never, ever going to be without her. And wherever I'm going next, I'm fired up about it. And even if I get sucker punched in the belly, I know that on the other side, the fire is going to activate and transform me and other people so that we can live fiery lives. And I thank you for listening. Thank you, Sonny. Woo! Thank you so Sonny. much. Sonny. The libations. <laughs> Very good. The libations. I say. Sonny, would you be willing to just tell us in like two minutes about what you've created during quarantine? Because oh, sure. Yes, yes. So one day um, before, I think they had just announced the quarantine in March. Um, it had to be, um, I know we started the movement on March 29th, so it was the week before that or even before that. I don't remember the exact day that they were like quarantine. But I was in the house and I was sitting here and I was like, oh, I'm going to go and sit on the couch. I wanted to flip through the channels and watch something on television. And, you know, I'm flipping through the cable channels and I heard a song, you know, music is my life in many ways. And so I heard Teddy Pendergrass's song, Wake Up Everybody. And it was the tail end of it, because I don't know if some of you have seen it, they did a documentary on Teddy Pendergrass's life. And it was at the tail end of the documentary when they were playing the song, Wake Up Everybody, No More Sleeping in Bed, No More um, Backwards Thinking, Time for Moving Ahead. Um, and it, I caught it, Spirit caught it. Shamati made me catch it. So I heard that, didn't watch the rest or try to you know, go on demand or anything. It's like my belly started churning. I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm supposed to do something with this song. She just started working with me. You know, it's like, yeah, do it, Ma, but don't do what you normally do. And so she was like, um, giving me, like I'm downloading into me 30 days, every single day, a different message, um, share it with community, do it in Zoom space, create a virtual space. I'm used to virtual spaces. I love virtual space equally as live because it's all about energy and intention. And I was like, okay, 30 days, I can do that. And she was like, not you, people, partners. So I cast the net and it's like 25 people I'm going to reach out to and ask them if they will join me in this space and have every single day somebody lead something, a thought leader, a healer, a breathologist, a, you know, birth worker, whomever, come in and do something powerful for the community. So while we're quarantining and we're shut in, we're going to transform and wake up everybody on different levels. And so Spirit gave me that shit like real quick, fast, wrote it, wrote it out, called a meeting the next day. People joined the meeting. I asked 25 people, 23 people said yes. And the only reason why the other two said no was one was grieving because her husband just passed. And she was like, she needed more time. And then the other person, I had some sort of conflict. And um, so they were yeses, but they couldn't do it at the time. So they've come back since because yesterday, I think we were up to 121 days. And my intention was 30 because my daughter had to trick me. She was like, 30 days? And just ask these people and then we'll be done. Once we started getting close to the 30 days, people were like, I hope you're not going to stop this. So it just kept going. I'm like, okay, I'll add 30 more days. Once again, yesterday, 121 days. So now it's a movement that has touched um, this country and 11 others, um, the Caribbean, Africa. People tune in every morning. Well, not every morning anymore, but for 100 straight days, it was every morning people coming in and just getting their lives, transforming, healing, telling stories they've never taught, told before, releasing secrets that were keeping them bound, discovering new tools to live and breathe, especially under quarantine. So the Wake Up Everybody movement is waking motherfuckers up every day. And I keep saying this word because I love curses. Y'all forgive me if you're sensitive. Um, <laughs> and I say motherfuckers because I, in a loving way, I truly do. Um, but uh, yeah, so the Wake Up Everybody movement is alive and I'm a conduit and um, I'm grateful in a vessel by which this has come forth. And it's all by, by the, the grace and the love of my daughter who's on the other side every single moment. Like, Ma, do this, do that. I don't ever have to do anything alone. I already had ancestral covering, but now it's an ancestor that I, I that was in my womb 
So there's nothing like that. I, I, there's nothing like that that I've ever experienced in my life. I held her in my womb and now she holds me in the womb of spirit. And so I'm grateful. So thank you for inviting me tonight and allowing me to share. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Shawnee. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank, thank you everyone for being here. I'm so, this was, this was really great. I mean, we, yeah. This was for, a for our final story marathon. Our final night of bringing storytellers into the space. I don't think it could have been any more wonderful than than this. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who told the story, to all of you who stayed through to the end to listen to stories, and to everybody who had no choice but to leave earlier. Thank you to them too. This was so great. This Can was, we? <laughs> Can yeah, we go ahead. and um, let's let's go in reverse order. Shawnee, much love. Thank Amazing. you. Let's give let's, uh, as much noise as you can make. <laughs> yes, you can remove yourselves and just like <laughs> incredible. Oh, wow. that was so beautiful. Thank you, sweetie. Yeah. Oh. And can we also have another round of applause for Shalewa? Shalewa! Thank you! Thank you. And, and I'm really happy to know that Shalewa and Shawnee know each other. I had no idea. That's so wonderful. Is that a, is that a How to Build a Fire connection unknown? <laughs> That's so beautiful. Yes. Um, Momo, you're still with us? Yeah, what up, what up? Thank you! Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you guys are incredible. That was incredible. <laughs> and uh, another round of applause for Cheryl. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> and Jimmy. Jimmy. Hey, you okay, where's Jimmy? Where's Jimmy? <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for gathering tonight. What? Thank you. Thank you. Across the universe. <laughs> I feel so cool. everyone. It was so much fun. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> this was our last time of bringing uh, storytellers in. Next month will be the last uh, night that Christina and I will host. We will also be telling stories next month, but we're going to have the new hosts tell stories. We're going to try to bring back some of the former hosts from the previous five seasons to tell stories. So it's going to be, what, what did you call it, Christina? I, I referred to it affectionately uh, as we were as we were preparing as the all-star wow time. Um, so <laughs> y'all can come in for the all-star wow so time. Yes, please join Bye. us next month for the all-star wow time. <laughs> <laughs> our, theme, our theme is transitions. It is you know, it's it's the the passing of the baton from us us to the next folks, and and beyond. You know. Yes. Going from. I know the fire continues. Our season is coming to a close. That's going to be on August twenty eighth. Please join us. It August will be in 28th. Zoom space. Yes. Hey, when you guys come back live again, you have to have a Zoom component. You have to bring us in. I know, right? Like, how yeah. can we learn out all of the people who are not in New York? We have to do it. Yeah. Do my You're all with us now. You, you suckered us in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The contingency. Stories yeah. will not be the same if I have to put on pants. They just. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I have a and when, when yeah. Substantia joins us with her camera on, she also brings, you know, Mr. My Real President with her because yeah. he's behind her all the time. Hello. So, <laughs> so that's Anybody what he's going to have in this case. Make yeah. sure you tell him I have a full and rich beard. He's trying to deny it, but it's full <laughs> and rich. Hang on, who's got a full and rich beard? <laughs> Justin has one. Don't quit. Don't don't try that. It's full and rich, darn it. Why Justin. are you telling us about your beard? Because Terrence is trying to deny how full and rich it is, and I need you guys to back me up on this. <laughs> this feels like a personal joke that none of us are involved. I know. So. It's full and rich. Full and rich. <laughs> okay. But I have a very very important question to ask. Yes. Please. 
Christina, how do I get on this um, video bandwagon for the manatees mating? I must see this. Oh, <laughs> I can hook you up with, with manatees mating. <laughs> I'm going to put 70s porn music to it. Uh. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. I, I think I've sent like one, two, three, four. I've sent like five, six people on this call currently. The video. <laughs> so I can let out. Uh, uh, Don't worry. Okay. Go to the I'll actual go to the Thank you. If you go to <laughs> your yeah, kayak, it's one of our actual Justin, honey, I don't know what you're saying, and I'm. I don't know if I need to know. Why you're here? I will, I will kiss the manatees. I assume that's what you said. Kiss the oh, manatees. Oh, the huge manatees. Not the manatees. There are signs. So this is the this is the moment, folks, where the night dissolves into hilarity. Into <laughs> complete nonsense. If we were meeting at open source, we'd be closing the gallery and walking around the corner to go drink at Freddy's, but to look at the frog that looks like this. Are, no. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a very good impression of the frog. That's a really good. I told you that frog looks like me naked. I told you that. <laughs> not the less the My husband just confirmed it. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> that <laughs> the only difference is that I find you completely adorable, whereas the frog freaks me the fuck out. Like, it's the scariest thing I've ever seen. So, I'm, only, <laughs> I'm only adorable because I whisper sweet nothings. If you can understand the frog, <laughs> it'd be adorable, too. Shawnee, you're incredible, Shawnee. That was one of so, the greatest stories I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank I you have so. to say, I've been, I've been joining... Shawnee's wake up community since the end of April when I first found out about it and I felt it has it. completely transformed what my quarantine has has been it's like yeah yes thank so, you Shawnee that was amazing that a fire in me that was real that was super real beautiful thank you so, I'm gonna do all the do you guys take care and yeah. bye, bye, bye. 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 Uh, Terrence again thank you hair from me any longer. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, get out of here. <laughs> Good night, everyone. I'm gonna go have a life. Good night, Good night everybody. everybody. Bye, Substantia. Bye-bye. What a life you have in quarantine, really. Good night. Sure. A good one. Bye. Good night, y'all. Peggy, the oh, bye. Night, Off you go. <laughs> See you, Janos. <laughs> oh, Cheryl. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Mom. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out, Mom. <laughs> why don't why don't I go and leave the two of you to have the Zoom space and check in? Oh my goodness, the plants Maybe. behind you look so pretty, Mary. That red and green is really nice. It's it's the, <laughs> it's the peach blossoms. Oh it my goodness, my it's so beautiful. Oh, Every wow. August. Well, it's not quite August, but climate change has done some things. So Yeah. You know, but that's lovely. Okay. I'm, oh, thank you. That's so Mary. beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Okay, I'm gonna thank say good night, but you two, you. you two can stick around. I that love was, you. That was thank so you. great to see you again. <laughs> Bye, yeah, we Andy. know each other for so long. Uh, I know. <laughs> it's. I think we have actually now officially known each other a year. It's fantastic. Yeah, because we would have first met each other. I think we first met just after the August is usually the gap. Yeah, we met before July we was. Met, yeah, like the end of July last year. Yeah, so. with um, it's our one year anniversary with um, Shafina and Terrence. Shafina and Terrence, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was so nervous. So was I, but then <laughs> as soon as I met you, I was like, "Oh, this is gonna be fun." <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> like, we're just gonna be fine. <laughs> I just, I just really wanted to be like good enough for you. <laughs> and then I was like, hang on, she's excellent. Now I just want to be good enough to be her friend, which has become a new kind of mandate for me to live. And like here we are, just completely in love with each other. So everything is working out. Everything. <laughs> it's in perhaps one would say alignment. 
I think that's exactly correct. <laughs> this is my giant hand. Get out of here, Stacey. Love it. Your mom wants to say something. Good night. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Wait, I'm going to assign you as the host because I can't leave without making someone the host. So you are now officially the host. I, I'm hosting. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Darling.